From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Dave Elwood, Johnny, Northwest Surety. Oh, hiya, Dave. How's the family? Oh, growing like weeds. You wouldn't even recognize them. I guess not. It's been a long time. Say, uh, you free at the moment, Johnny? Well, there's nothing going on here except the rent. What's on your mind? I don't know exactly. Maybe smoke, maybe a fire. I got a girl here in you the office. You executives really live. Well, she's pretty enough to... Say, why don't you come on over here and meet her? Social, or do I get paid for it? You get paid. Uh-huh. Jay Dollar, Gigolo, personal attention to Lonely Hearts, special Lonely rates. Hearts? Why'd you say that? Say what? Lonely Hearts. I don't know. Why? Is it a code of some kind? Well, you could call it that, I guess. What's it mean? Johnny, if this girl is telling the truth, it means murder. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northwest Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lonely Hearts matter. Item one, a dollar and sixty cents taxi fare from my apartment to the Northwest Surety Building in the office of Dave Elwood, Executive Claims Adjuster. A hard-working little man with thinning hair who, even after twenty years in the game, still couldn't help making every claim a personal matter. He met me in the outer office and led me off to one side. She's waiting inside there, Johnny. I wanted to brief you before you met her. Who is she, Dave? Her name is Norma Wells. She's from Chicago. She flew in from there this morning. Hasn't had any sleep. and She's pretty upset. Mm -hmm. What about her? Her father died three days ago. Suddenly, unexpectedly. What did he die of? Acute enteritis, supposedly. The death certificate hasn't been signed yet. Is that what you meant by murder? And his daughter thinks so. Mm -hmm. Was he insured with you? $50,000, term life, written five months ago. Who's the beneficiary? This daughter? No, his wife. Uh, his second wife, that is. The girl's mother died years ago. Wells remarried a month before the policy was issued. A woman named Mabel Burke. The insurance is payable to her. And the Wells girl thinks she killed him. That's what she says. She's pretty mixed up. Why did she come here? And I'm not quite sure, Johnny. Suppose you ask her. Okay, let's go. This way. What about that... Lonely Hearts crack you made on the phone. Well, that's how he met this new wife, this Mabel Burke, through a Lonely Hearts club. Like they say, marriage is a lottery. In this case, it sounds more like Russian roulette. Yeah. In here. Miss Wells, this is Johnny Dollar. He's a specialist, an expert in this kind of thing. I'm sure he'll be able to help you. What do you do, Mr. Mr. Dollar? Miss Wells. Now, I'm going to leave you two alone. I have a couple of things i got to take care of. You just punch the intercom if you want me. Right, Dave. Thanks. Would you, uh, would you care for a cigarette, Miss Wells? No, thank you. I... Yes, yes, I will, too. I... Oh, please forgive me. I... I just can't seem to think straight. Oh, that's perfectly understandable. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Forgive me for being so blunt, but when was the last time you had something to eat? Why... Why, yesterday morning, I, I guess. Uh-huh. Dave. Yes, Johnny? Suppose you could send out for a glass of orange juice, a hot roll, a pot of coffee? Oh, sure. I'll have one of the girls go get it. Good, thanks. No, no, please. I, I really could You're really going to, though. You're shaking so hard you can hardly hold on to that cigarette. I know. It's so stupid of me. You and your father were pretty close, I imagine. Yes. Until he married her. What kind of a woman is she? Well, she's strange. It's hard to explain. She's... She's sort of vague, fuzzy around the edges, if, if that makes any sense. It, it's like she isn't even there sometimes, but, but away off somewhere in, in, in time or space. A little batty, is that what you're implying? No, no, not really. She could be as sharp as a tack when she wanted to. But something about her. Well, I was scared of her, Mr. Dollar. And I don't actually know why. I see. My father and I could never be alone. Somehow she always managed to be there, separating us, driving us apart. Did she ever say anything that would lead you to believe that? She didn't have to. Just being there was enough to... All right, I know what you're thinking. Father fixation, second wife, jealous daughter, neurotic imagination. It's a possibility, isn't it? No. Don't you suppose I thought of that? Made allowances for it? 
Do you think I'm a fool? I, I, I don't know what to think, Miss Wells. You told Dave Elwood you believed your stepmother had murdered your father. And so far, the only reason you've given is the fact that she was around all the time. Maybe he wanted her around. Maybe that's why he married her. Of course he wanted her around. That's not what made me suspicious. Then what did? The fact that he took out life insurance, named her as beneficiary? Not at the time. I wasn't suspicious at all, Mr. Dollar. Not until... until the night he... he died. Oh, I... I was hurt, yes, and... and I felt out of place, so... Well, I moved out of the house three months ago and took an apartment off the loop. But I... I didn't have the slightest idea she might be planning to kill him. Did he carry any insurance before they were married? Some protection for you in case of... Uh... Oh, no, he, he didn't feel that it was necessary. He, he'd set up a trust fund, and, and there are some bonds and so on that I suppose will come to me. I see. No, the policy was entirely her idea. Thinking back, it, it seems to me she started talking about insurance the first week after they were married. And he finally gave in. If he hadn't, I... I think he'd still be alive. Mm -hmm. Just what were the circumstances of his death? I don't know. I wasn't there. She saw to that. What do you mean? Well, he was taken ill suddenly. In the middle of the night. He wanted her to call me, but she wouldn't do it. Why not? She claimed she didn't think it was anything serious. So there was no need of it. Instead, she called the doctor. Her doctor. A few minutes after he arrived... My father died. Then they called me. After it was all over. This doctor, is he the one who has refused so far to sign a death certificate? Oh, he was going to sign it all right. Until I got there and kicked up a scene. An obvious case of acute enteritis, he called it. Then he backed down. Decided maybe he should have another opinion. I went to father's doctor. But he said there was nothing he could do. Because he hadn't been called in at the time. He's the one who suggested I come here. Why so? He said the insurance company would help me. Since they were involved, too, they'd advise me what to do. Well, uh, what did he think about that diagnosis, acute enteritis? He said, he said it was possible, but extremely doubtful. He knew father's physical condition. He treated him for years. Mm -hmm. How long had your father known this Mabel Burke before they were married? Less than a month. He'd answered a Lonely Hearts ad in the paper. So I found out later by accident. Oh, I see. They both seemed embarrassed by the way they'd met. Was it a private ad or an organization? A club of some sort. The Rendezvous Club. They have an office on Atlantic Avenue. Mr. Dollar, it's not just imagination. Father's own doctor feels there's something wrong, too. That's why he sent me here. I'm not crazy. Easy now, easy. She killed him for his insurance. I know she did. Maybe, maybe. But there's not much to go on. Not at the moment, anyway. Think it's about time for a coffee break? Yeah, I imagine it's a little past time for Miss Wells. I couldn't. Really, I... Oh, yes, you could. Yes, you could. Go ahead now. Dig in. I'll be back in a few minutes. Have a word with you, Dave? Right, Johnny. Well, what do you think? I think it needs some looking into. How soon can you get Miss Wells and me on a plane for Chicago? An hour and a half. I've already checked. Good. I'll have her get a court order for an autopsy in case the coroner hasn't already asked for one. And we'll take it from there. Then you think the girl is telling the truth? I wouldn't bet on it. Expense account item two, $96.40. Transportation from Hartford and taxi tips and incidentals in Chicago. I dropped Norma Wells at her apartment, checked in at a hotel, and phoned the coroner's office. I learned that an autopsy request had been filed, but was being delayed pending a court order. I informed them that the daughter was available and willing now to cooperate with them. I left my name and asked the office to keep in touch with me. Item three, two dollars and ten cents. Taxi to the offices of the Rendezvous Club. Introductions arranged. Mail forwarded. Lonely hearts mended, and possibly murders planned. Well, hello. I must be in the wrong place. What do you mean? I mean, I, I can't see you as the lonely type. Oh, I'm not. I mean, I'm not a client. I work here. Really? For some reason, I'd always had the idea that these clubs were run by sweet old ladies of 75 or so. Oh, well, I don't exactly run it. Or at least I don't own it, if that's what you mean. Hey, you're not a client, for gosh sake. Any rules against it? Well, no. Well, how do I go about it? 
I mean, becoming a client. Well, you either write in or come in like you are now. Then you fill out a form, tell all about yourself, and attach a photograph. And... Look, Buster, there's no use trying to kid you. Huh? We don't have a woman in our files under 45 years old. Well, maybe I got a mother complex. What? So I uh, fill out a form. Uh, what do you do with it then? Well, we'll keep it on file. Then we send out bulletins to the active members and forward letters back and forth. Or you can come in here and be introduced. And... Look, are you serious? Don't I act serious? Well, I don't get it. A young guy with your looks and... I bet you're selling something. No, no. As a matter of fact, I uh, just got in town and I'm trying to locate a certain fellow. I, I was told he's a member of your club. Oh, well, why didn't you say so? What's his name? Jonathan Wells. He probably got his address. Jonathan Wells? Yeah. Have you got a file on him? Who are you? You're with the police. Police? Now, what gives you that idea? Well, I don't know anything about the man you're looking for. No? Well, uh, suppose we check through the files. It's not here. We don't keep the files here. Where do you keep them? They're not here. Well, uh, maybe they're in the next office. Through that door there. No, you can't go in there. Relax now. Take it easy. You have no right in there. I won't let you oh, go. No. Oh, you stop now, it. Now, you just stand right up there on that desk and stay out of trouble. Let me down. Who do you think you are, anyhow? Get out of here. You go get a warrant if you want to. Who was in here? Nobody. Do you smoke cigars? Of course I don't smoke yeah, cigars. Yeah, right there in the ashtray, still burning. Somebody just sneaked out through that door in the hall. Who was he? What's your name? Tetler. Fanny Tetler. How long have you worked here? A year. Hey, I've got a hunch you're not a policeman. I didn't say I was. What about Wells? Have you got a file on him? No. What happened to it? I don't know what you're talking about. How about, about? Mabel Burke? Mabel Burke. Have you got a file on her? Of course not. What do you mean, of course not? She and Wells met through this club. Look, Buster, Mabel Burke owns this club. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... Another day, another husband, another death, and a sweet little old lady rocks and smiles. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is 
Max Lance here, Mr. Dollar, DA's office. Oh? The coroner tells me you're cutting yourself in on this Jonathan Wells thing. I'm representing the insurance company. Wells carried a $50,000 policy payable to his widow. Yeah, so I hear. What about the autopsy? Any results? Not yet. The coroner's still working on it. I understand it was Wells' daughter who called you fellas in on this case. Yes, on the advice of her family doctor. I know. I talked to him. Only his version puts a different slant on things. What do you mean? Well, he thought she was suffering from temporary hysteria. He was only trying to calm her. He didn't think she'd really fly back to Hartford and stir up a mess like this. I see. Her father's sudden death must have been quite a shock to her. It may have caused her to uh, imagine things. Things like murder? Maybe. It's possible, anyway. What do you think? I think I'll wait for the results of that autopsy, Mr. Lancer. I'll keep in touch. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northwestern Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, The Lonely Hearts Matter. Location, Chicago, Illinois. Expense account continued. Item six, $2.10 for a late lunch at my hotel. I finished it, went up to my room, and started trying to fit the few facts I had into some kind of a pattern that made sense. Max Lancer at the DA's office might be right. Maybe it was nothing more than just hysterical suspicion. And she'd admitted herself that she was hurt and jealous when he married Mabel Burke. Sudden death could still be natural death. And yet, all I could do at the moment was wait for the results of that autopsy. Yeah? Mr. Dollar. Mm, who is it? It's me, Norma Wells. Oh, all right. Just a minute. Come in. Come in, Miss Wells. Thank you. What's wrong? I'm scared. Of what? I don't know exactly. Oh? Well, here. Here. Run over here and sit down. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, what do you mean you don't know exactly? Could I be, be losing my mind, Mr. Dollar? <laughs> if you were, you'd be the last one to think so. Now, tell me what's happened. Well, I, I went to the coroner's office to sign the authorization for the autopsy and then went back to my apartment. And a little while... Later, the phone rang, and when I answered it, there was nobody on the line. A wrong number, maybe. No. I mean, I mean, there was somebody on the line, but they didn't say anything. I kept saying hello, and then there was a click, and, and the line went dead. And that's all that happened? No. A short time afterward, I, I heard footsteps out in the hall. They stopped at my door, and I kept waiting for someone to ring the bell. When they didn't, I... I finally got up enough courage to open the door. There was nobody there. I see. A few minutes after that, the phone rang again. The same thing as before. I couldn't stay there any longer. I ran out and got a taxi and came here. Well, who do you think might be doing a thing like that, Miss Wells? I don't know. But somebody is. I'm not just imagining things. Max Lancer, the DA's investigator, seems to think you might be. I know. He talked to me at the coroner's office. That's why I came to you, Mr. Dollar. You've got to help me, please. I'd be glad to, but how? Well, there must be something you can do. Yeah, yeah, I can wait for that autopsy report. And at the moment, that's about all I can do. Without some definite evidence of a crime, something stronger than mere suspicion, we don't have a leg to stand on. But, but suppose the report doesn't show anything. Well, then I wipe the egg off my face and go back to Hartford. But, but look, maybe she was... She was clever enough to kill my father in some way that wouldn't show up in an autopsy. Such as? I don't know. But I do know, as sure as I'm sitting here, that she married him and got him to take out that insurance policy with the full intention of murdering him. Well, such things have been known, all right. Somebody using a correspondence club to contact wealthy pigeons. Did you know that your stepmother owns that Lonely Hearts Club? Owns it? That's what the girl in charge told me. A Fanny Tetler. Do you know her? No. I've never heard of her. And neither Mabel nor my father ever mentioned that she owned the place. She apparently has somebody running it for her. A man, I think. Any idea who he might be? No. He slipped out before I got a chance to see him. Smoked cigars. He left one burning in the ashtray. Wait. Maybe it's Burton. Burton? Burton Creeley, her nephew. He smokes cigars. Well, that's the first I've heard of him. Oh, he's detestable. 
He moved in on us right after Mabel and my father were married. He's the main reason why I left the house. I couldn't stand him. He was always after me, bothering me. Is he still living there? I guess so. Was he in the house the night your father died? Yes. At least he was when I got there. That was an hour afterward, as I told you. Does he have a job, work anywhere? I don't think he's ever worked. He lives off of her. Uh Uh-huh. He and your father get along all right? Oh, my father could get along with anyone. He always managed to see the best in people. And then Burton was careful to, to act different around him. I see. I suppose you think that's some more of my imagination. Well, frankly, Miss Wells, I don't know what to think. If there was only some way to prove what I'm sure of. Well, let's wait for that autopsy report. Meantime, I think I'll go out and talk to your stepmother. What about me? Stay right where you are. Don't go out of this room. When I get back, we'll pick up some things from your apartment, and you can check in here at this hotel for a few days. Expense account item seven, taxi to Lakeshore Drive and the beachfront residence of the late Jonathan Wells. I was beginning to feel more and more like a fool. It looked as though Max Lancer might be right. Apparently, a jealous, hysterical girl had lost her head and stirred up a nasty mess, all without one single fact to back up her suspicions. I had a hunch the autopsy report was going to show death from natural causes. For two cents, I'd have thrown the case over. In fact, I didn't even see where I had a case. Good afternoon, young man. How are you? How do you do? Are you Mrs. Wells? Yes, that's right. Is there something I can do for you? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm representing the company that holds the insurance policy on your late husband's life. Oh, well, you must be mistaken. Mr. Morningby represents that company, young man. Mr. Matthew R. Morningby. Uh, Mr. Morningby is the local agent. I'm from the home office in Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, I see. Yes, I have my credentials right here if you'd like to see Oh, no, 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 that isn't necessary. I always judge people by their faces. And you have an honest face, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I wonder if I could ask you a few questions, Mrs. Wells. Well, I suppose so. I know this must be painful for you, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. Oh, well, now, don't you worry about me. I'm all right. Of course, I miss Jonathan and all that. He was a terribly nice man, terribly. But I think of death as just being a doorway to a greater and more glorious life. Well, that's uh, one way of looking at it. You just come right in, young man, and ask all the questions you're a mind to. Thank you. You come right in here, and we'll sit down and have a nice chat. Oh, this is a very attractive house, Mrs. Wells. Oh, yes, yes, I think so, too. Jonathan built it years ago. He and his first wife lived here, you know. Of course, I've changed the drapes and things. Uh, Just some of the little things sit right down there now. Thank you. And his daughter, too. Uh, She lived here the first month we were married, and then she moved into town. Oh, a strange little thing, really. Sort of uh, nervous and irritable. I've met her, Mrs. Wells. Oh, well, then you know what she's like. Oh, it's too bad, too. Would you like some tea and cookies, Mr. Dollar? Uh, No, thanks. That's one thing Jonathan wouldn't miss for the world. His tea and cookies at four o'clock every afternoon. Every afternoon. Oh? The house just doesn't seem the same without him. No, I imagine it doesn't. That's how I won his heart, you know, with my cookies and cakes. Oh? Oh, he really did adore them. And it was such a pleasure baking things for a person who appreciated them so much. Yes. It makes you feel lonesome and lost not having anybody to cook for. Do you ever feel lonesome, Mr. Dollar? Well, I guess everybody does at times. Why, at the time I met Jonathan, I was feeling so lonesome I could just cry. Mr. Burke had died two years before. Mr. Burke? Yes, he was my husband before, Jonathan. That was in St. Louis, of course. I see. Oh, he was a fine man, too. Walter Mabley Burke. Tall and handsome and impressive looking. Just like his name sounds. And a perfect picture of health. Right up to the day he died. His death was sudden? Unexpected? Oh, yes. A complete surprise. Acute indigestion, the doctor called it. Mm. Of course, I don't think he was quite as thoughtful as Jonathan. Jonathan was always so considerate, and he he was a... Oh, my gracious, here I go, just rambling on and on. You didn't come here to listen to my silly little affairs. No, 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 they're very interesting. Well, I've always tried to keep busy and keep my mind occupied. That's why I started in business. The Lonely Hearts Club. Oh, well, you've heard about it. Well, I admit I felt kind of foolish at first about starting it. I mean, you know how people josh about those kinds of clubs... 
It was Burton's idea, really. He's my nephew, you know. Oh, dear, I wish he were here this afternoon so you could meet him. So do I. He's such a nice boy. He thought I'd do real well at that kind of business, and he was right, too, absolutely right. Oh, not money, you understand, but it was loads of fun meeting all those nice people, especially men, yes. I see. That's how I met Jonathan. So I was told. That's the way it happened. He wrote into the club, and I sent him my picture, and that's what started it. I remember when Burton showed me the letter, he said, Aunt Mabel, this one sounds like your kind of man, and he certainly was, too. Uh -huh. Does Burton help you with the club? Oh, well, he runs it, really. He's such a sweet boy, and he works so hard. I just don't know what I'd do without Burton. I don't know what I'd do. Yes, I imagine he's a great comfort to oh, you. Oh, you have no idea, Mr. Darwin. I suppose not. Well, I guess I'd better run along, Mrs. Wells. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. It seems like young folks nowadays don't often have the gift for conversation the way they did in my time. Well, things move faster today. Well, I certainly hope that company of yours moves fast, young man. Well... I have to start house hunting, you know. The estate and everything goes to Jonathan's daughter, and all I have is the insurance. Yes. Oh, it's such a bother, Mr. Dollar, the funeral and moving and all the details. Seems like I just have the worst luck with my husband's. I walked out of there groggy, my head spinning. No wonder Norma Wells was nervous and hysterical. I felt that way myself after only a few minutes of it. And I still had no case, not one piece of evidence. I'd had a pleasant chat with a sweet old lady, a little on the dotty side, maybe, but that was all. Dead end. Max Lancer from the DA's office was waiting for me in the hotel lobby. You'll notice I'm holding my hat in my hand, Mr. Dallin. How come? It's a symbol of humility. We were right all along. According to the coroner's report, Jonathan Wells died from a dose of ground glass. So it's murder after all. Then in that case, do something for me, will you? From now on, I'm your man. Contact the authorities in St. Louis and have them check into a death that happened there about two and a half years ago. A man named Walter Maberly Burke. Who's he? Mrs. Wells was married to him at the time. Uh-oh. Another murder? No, just a matter of bad luck. She told me so herself. <laughs> Now here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a strange attack, a scared girl, a hunt in the dark, and 13 knots make a noose. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ready with your call to Hartford, Mr. Dollar. Go ahead, please. Johnny, what's up? Plenty, Dave. The Wells girl was right. Her father was murdered. We just got the autopsy report. He died from a dose of ground glass. And I'll put a stop order on the insurance claim. It was filed this afternoon. And something else, Dave. A man died in St. Louis about two and a half years ago. I wonder if you'd have mutual records service check and see if he was insured. His name was Walter Maberly Burke. Burke? Well, Johnny, that's Yeah, I a... know. Jonathan Wells' widow was previously married to Burke. They were married at the time of his death. And he also died suddenly and mysteriously. Holy smoke. Just call her murdering Mabel. Oh, you haven't met her, Dave. She's just a sweet old lady who's had a little bad luck now and then. And she regards death as the doorway to a greater and more glorious life. Oh? Well, that sounds very noble. It would. If she didn't keep slamming the door... From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Chicago, to the home office, Northwestern Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lonely Hearts Matter. Expense account continued. Item eight, $7.65, dinner for Norma Wells and myself. It was brought up by room service, and we ate alone in my suite. Norma didn't feel like facing the dining room. I was still trying to figure her out. When she'd come to me with a claim that her father had been poisoned by her stepmother for his insurance, I'd tagged her for a jealous, hysterical kid, and that still went. But now, with the autopsy report in, it was more than that. She was right. Jonathan Wells had been poisoned. And again, when she told me someone was hanging around her apartment, I only half believed her. But by now, I was about ready to believe anything. 
I'd have sworn I couldn't eat a bite. Well, you needed it. You've been going on nothing but nerve. And I'll still be. Until this is all over. Well, it shouldn't take long now. That autopsy report gives us the green light. The police will move in now, and we can put the pressure on. It's, it's such a terrible thing. What? Why, six months ago, when she married him, she was planning this right then. It looks that way, all right. Father was always so good to her. And yes, and to that worthless nephew of hers, Burton Creeley. What kind of a mind does a person have, Mr. Dollar? To do a thing like she did. Well, it hasn't been proved yet that she's the one who did it, Miss Wells. No, but who else could have? I don't know. More coffee? No, thanks. Well, whenever you're finished, we'll take a taxi over to your apartment and pick up whatever you need and then get you a room here at the hotel. I don't think you're in danger, but I imagine you'll feel a lot less nervous here. Oh, I will. And, and I do appreciate your, your help and kindness, Mr. Dollar. Forget it. It's part of my job. Only this time, when you check in, you go to your room and stay put. What do you mean? When I came back from talking to Mabel Burke, Max Lancer from the DA's office was waiting for me down in the lobby. He said he'd phoned here to the room five or six times, got no answer. I was here. I, I heard the phone, but, well, I didn't know if, if you wanted me to answer. He sent a bellboy up to knock on the door. Well, I, I must have been in the shower. I was here all the time. Don't you believe me? Any reason I shouldn't believe you? Are you through eating? Yes. Okay, let's go. Expense account item nine, a dollar and eighty cents. Taxi from the hotel to Norma Wells' apartment. Night had fallen over the city, and the tall buildings of the loop shimmered above the noisy blaze of lights. Laughing groups of early dinner goers jostled through the scrambling packs of late shoppers. Auto horns, blaring jazz, newsboys, traffic whistles. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Yesterday never was. Tomorrow's only a dream, and today's nearly gone. So hurry it up and let's get going. We'll sleep when we're dead. Like Jonathan Wells on his cool marble slab in the city morgue. It's apartment C, the next door on the left. Right. <laughs> Have a key here somewhere. Sure you locked it? Oh, yes, I always... It's not locked. Well, you were scared when you left and maybe you No. Did. I remember locking the door. You sure? Yes. Now it's Stay some... back. What is it, Mr. Dollar? Come on in. Oh. Oh, no. Yeah, it looks as though you've had visitors, Miss Wells. The whole place turned upside down. Why would anyone want to do that? Looking for something, probably. For what? I don't know. Suppose you look around, see if you notice anything missing. It's no use, Mr. Dollar. I've gone through the whole place twice now, and I'm certain that nothing's been taken. But they had to have some reason to break in here, go through everything this way. I suppose so, but... Well, I'm positive there's nothing missing. All right. If there isn't, there isn't. Well, do you suppose that coffee's ready now? Oh, I think so. Come on in the kitchen. I guess you'll believe me now. Somebody was hanging around here earlier today. Mm. Just wish I could figure what they're after. Hmm. Looks plenty strong. There's sugar there on the table. I'll get some cream from the refrigerator. Don't bother on my account. I drink it black. Well, not me. I use plenty of both. Lots and lots of cream and two heaping spoons of sugar. Well, they must have had a reason to break in here. If it wasn't to steal something, then what was the reason? The sugar looks funny. Doesn't make sense at all. I guess I ought to keep it covered. Mm. The sugar. I was saying it looked funny. Well... Wait a minute. Maybe they broke in to leave something. Leave something? Yeah. Here, give me that cup and the spoon. What are you doing? Look. Oh, that's funny. It didn't even dissolve. The sugar dissolved, all right. Well, then what's that in the spoon? Brown glass. I phoned Max Lancer and had him send over a policewoman to accompany Norma Wells back to the hotel, get her checked in, and stay with her overnight. Then I called the Wells residence. The old lady answered the phone herself, and I asked for her nephew, Burton Creeley. She said he wasn't in. 
So on an off chance, I took a taxi to the office of the Rendezvous Club, Lonely Hearts Unlimited. There was no light showing behind the transom over the door. The door was unlocked. I fumbled around for a light switch, but somebody beat me to it. Get your hands up! Well, at least I've found you in this time. What are you doing here? Who are you? Put that gun away, Creeley. Or if you're going to use it, you'd better take the safety off first. Safety? What are you doing? All right, let go of it, Creeley. Thanks. You think you'll get away with this, mister? You're crazy. Mm, My mistake. The safety was off. Sorry to rough you up, but I don't like people who go around pointing guns at people without any reason for it. You broke in here. That's illegal entry. I'll have you arrested. Why not? Why not? The phone's right behind you. Who are you, anyway? Johnny Dollar. I'm a special investigator for the Northwestern Surety Company. What? I imagine the name is familiar to you, since they're holding a $50,000 life insurance policy on the late Jonathan Wells, with your Aunt Mabel named as beneficiary. What are you doing here? Looking for you, as a matter of fact. What for? I wanted to ask you why you sneaked out through the door there the other day in the office when I was here earlier. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, knock it off, Creeley. You got in such a hurry, you left your cigar burning there in the ashtray. The same brand you're smoking right now. Uh, I I thought you were a bill collector. You knew who I was. You were listening there at the door while I talked to your secretary. Now, why'd you run out? Oh, all right, all right. I did know who you were, Mr. Dollar, but... Well, you're misinterpreting things. No kidding. In what way? I was... Late for an appointment. I, I didn't want to get tied up. I figured you could find out anything you wanted to know from my aunt. I, I, I saw no necessity for talking to you. I see. Where have you been since then? Right here, most of the time. And the rest of the time? Well, what difference does it make? You weren't over at Norma Wells' apartment by any chance. <laughs> Are you kidding? I detest that girl. Why so? Because she's a smug, self-satisfied little phony. She's too big for a britches. What makes you think I'd be hanging around her? Somebody was. I don't get it. Somebody broke into her apartment this afternoon or this evening and turned it upside down. She hasn't got anything I want. They didn't take anything. They broke in to leave something. I found some ground glass planted in her sugar bowl. Ground glass? Sound familiar? What are you getting at? You mean you haven't heard about the coroner's report on Jonathan Wells? No, why? Why? What has that got to do with... Mr. Wells died from a dose of ground glass. You you mean he was killed, murdered? I don't imagine he ate the stuff intentionally, do you? I can't believe it. Well, the police aren't having that trouble. I just can't imagine anybody. Such a nice guy. He always got along fine with everybody. Including you? Yes. We... Got to be good friends. What about his daughter, Norma? I don't really know. She blew a top and moved out a month after Aunt Mabel and Jonathan were married. Why? Jealous, I guess. She couldn't stand it to see her father pay any attention to anybody but her. Did they quarrel much? Jonathan never quarreled with anybody. No, she just seemed to go around with a mad on most of the time. She's a rare one, that girl. What do you mean? Oh, she seems to think of herself as a princess or something. I understand you made quite a play for her at first. I suppose she told you that. Did you? I tried to be friendly to her, that's all. I I don't know what she chose to call it. Mr. Dollar, I'm engaged to Miss Tetler, the girl that works here in the office. Mm -hmm. What do you do for a living, Mr. Creeley? I take care of this correspondence club for Aunt Mabel. I've got sort of a heart condition. I can't work too hard. I see. You know, it might be a good idea if you checked in with the police. They'll probably want to talk to you. Well, who do they think did it? Well, they haven't arrested anybody yet, but there are a lot of straws pointing in one direction. What direction? Towards your Aunt Mabel, I'm afraid. But that's ridiculous. Now, she may be a little vague, not quite all with it, maybe, but she wouldn't do a thing like that. They're out to frame her, that's what they're doing. Who else had a motive, Mr. Creeley? Well, what about his daughter? She stands to gain by all this. She inherits the estate. Maybe she faked that burglary, planted the ground glass in her apartment herself. Have you thought of that, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Yeah, I've thought of it. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, 
Another murder comes to light, another link in a long chain, and an old lady weeps for the wasted years. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Max Lancer, Johnny. DA's office. How is she? Pretty weak. The hospital staff are doing all they can for her, but they don't give her much hope. Has she been able to talk? No, not yet. Maybe not ever. It was ground glass, all right. The doctor's sure of it now. The same as her husband. Why, Johnny? Why her? I'll guess with you. Maybe she figured we were closing in on her. The game was over and took this way out. We had nothing on her, Max. Suspicion, that's all we were going on. She'd had two husbands in the last three years. Both of them died from the effects of ground glass poisoning. And both times she goes for $50,000 insurance. That's all we had to go on. And it wasn't enough. But maybe she didn't realize that. I can give you a better theory. Okay, sound off. Somebody tried to murder her. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Chicago, to the Home Office, Northwestern Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lonely Hearts Matter. Expense account, final page. (laughs) Item 15, $2.60. Sandwiches, cigarettes, and incidentals, which I had sent up from a lunchroom across the street from the hospital. It was evening again now. I'd spent the whole day in the lounge down the hall from the room where Mabel Burke Wells was fighting for her life. Fighting and slowly losing. I'd tagged her as a murderess responsible for the deaths of two of her husbands. But then she herself had been struck down by the same poison. And now only she had the key to the puzzle. A key she might never give up. Calling Dr. Kenworthy. Dr. Kenworthy. Mr. Hmm. In the room. Oh, hiya, Creeley. Dr. Any change Kenworthy. yet in my aunt's condition? No. No, I just talked to the doctor. If anything, she's even weaker. She didn't even recognize me. I've been in the room off and on all day. She didn't even know I was there. Well, she's in pretty bad shape. Sit down. You look a little rocky yourself. Thanks. I feel that way. Aunt Mabel's been a real mother to me. This is quite a shock. Yes, I imagine. Doctor says it's the same thing that killed Jonathan. Yes, that's right. Well, that just doesn't make any sense, Mr. Dollar. Say, tell me something. Did anyone come to the house to see your aunt? Either last night after Lancer left or this morning before I got there? And as far as I know, why do you think someone might have? I don't know. She'd already gone to bed when I came in last night. I left early this morning. It's possible, of course, but I don't believe anyone did. She never had any visitors. She's always been a lonely person, actually. Maybe that's why she started the Lonely Hearts Club. Yes, it was. I suggested the idea to her as a way to meet friends and be around people she loved it. Why couldn't she and Jonathan's daughter, Norma Wells, get along? Ah, she's a strange girl. Always had a chip on her shoulder. I spoke to Jonathan about it once, but he just laughed it off. He said Norma just had too much possessiveness. Yeah, well, I guess it's natural. The two of them had been alone a long time until he married your aunt. Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Well, the police think that Aunt Mabel killed him, don't they? They've got some pretty strong reasons for thinking so. And the way she is now, dying in her, I suppose they think she did it herself? It's possible she did. Is that what you think? Oh, I'm not sure I am. Oh, come on over, Miss Wells. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt. Just making conversation. You two know each other, I guess. Yes. Well, I think I'll get on a cup of coffee. See you later, Doctor. I can't stand that man. So I gather. How is she? Not much change. Couldn't bear just sitting in that hotel room wondering what was happening. She hasn't been able to talk? No, not yet. I don't understand it. My father died less than two hours after he was first stricken. Difference in constitution, maybe. Different dosage. She's too mean to die. She's... I'm sorry I said that. It was cruel and heartless, but that's the way I feel. I, I can't help it. 
When I think of my father, so kind and gentle, murdered in cold blood by that woman... If she did do it, then why this? You mean the same thing happening to her? That's right. Remorse, maybe, if she's capable of it. Or fear. I don't know why. Maybe she's insane. I've always thought she might be. Oh, she's sane, all right. As sane as any of us. And what do you think happened to her? <sighs> oh, I don't know. We probably never will know. She'll die without talking, and, and there'll never be any proof. That's a possibility. That, that worthless nephew of hers will collect the insurance, I suppose. That's not my department. But under the circumstances, I think he'd have a legal claim. It's, it's horrible. Mr. Dollar. What is it, nurse? She's conscious, and she wants to see you. She was a dying woman. I could see at the moment Norma Wells and I walked into the room. I sent the nurse to find her nephew, Burton Creeley, and he slipped in quietly a few seconds later. The old lady lay back on her pillows, smiling to herself as usual, bright-eyed with a last burst of false vitality. Death was only minutes away. All of us knew it, and she knew it too. My gracious. All of you look so serious. But it was nice of you to come. It keeps a body from feeling lonesome. You save your strength now, Mrs. Wells. What on earth for? Body can't enjoy the last few breaths. Might as well not be living. Please, Aunt Mabel, let Don't that's... you please me, Burton Creeley. Straighten your tie. You look a fright. My, certainly nice to see you here, Norma. I, well, I, I, I just... always said to Jonathan... It's just a crying shame that Norma and me can't hit it off better. <laughs> he just laughed and Mrs. Said, oh, Wells. Be quiet, young man. I know what you're after. All in due time. As a matter of fact, that's why I wanted to see you. I've been in my senses for the last hour, but I just didn't let on. I wanted a chance to think. I'm about to die, you know. Aunt Mabel, don't talk that way. Oh, simmer down, Burton. Death is only the doorway to a more glorious life. You remember that. Mr. Dollar, I didn't do it. I know. I finally came to that conclusion myself, too late. You mean you're not surprised? No. Well, at least it's a help that I don't have to convince you. I'm afraid that. I won't have that much time. What are you saying? You heard me, Norma. I said I didn't kill Jonathan. Why, oh, I was much too fond of him to do a thing like that. Who did kill him, Mrs. Wells? That's what I was puzzling over for the last hour. Then, when I figured it out, I had to decide whether to let sleeping dogs lie. Or see that justice took its course. And I... I... Easy now. <laughs> but I remembered how kind Jonathan had been and decided to... Aunt Mabel, don't, don't try to talk anymore. Those chocolates, Burton, that you gave me this morning, oh, that was an awful naughty thing to do, Burton. And now you have to be punished for it. Wait a minute, Mrs. Wells. And Jonathan. Walter, too. Yeah, they were always so nice to you. I just can't understand why you did it. Mr. Dollar. Yes? You take Burton in hand. Give him... Give him a good talking to. Explain to him that... Mrs. Wells. That he... He must go around. Is she... Yeah. Well, Creeley... Get your hands up, Dollar. Huh? One move from you and Norma gets a bullet right in her back. Let go of me! Into the closet, Dollar. Don't go on. you fool, Creeley. Hurry up. Go on. Now, remember one thing, Dollar. I'm taking Miss High and Mighty here along. If they get me, then she goes, too. The door was solid, built to last. It took me several minutes to smash it open. The nurse in the corridor said Creedy and Norma Wells had gone down in the elevator. 
I grabbed the floor phone and called the main desk in the lobby. They said some man and a girl had just stolen an ambulance from the emergency driveway and headed west onto the Lakeshore Parkway. And at that moment, Max Lancer stepped off the elevator. Johnny, what's going on? Back to your car, Max. Come on. We could hear the ambulance siren for a while somewhere up ahead of us. Then we lost it. Max kept the red light flashing and the accelerator on the floorboard. The speedometer needle edge past 85, touched 90, and hung there. We were nine miles up the parkway when I saw it. Parked cars, a crowd gathering, and the ambulance rolled over against the bank. Where are they? A man in the crew got out of it. They ran into the brush there. He's carrying a gun. Take the east side, Johnny. I'll go around the other way. All right, Max. And watch yourself. The undergrowth was heavy. A mass of dark shadows slashed here and there by beams of light from the headlamps of the cars on the road above. Max disappeared into the night, and I moved on alone. Minutes passed. Then a car light shifted slightly, and I saw them, only a few yards away, crouched against a tree. He was holding the gun pressed against his side. Hold it, Dollar. You're finished, Creeley. You'd better give up. You know what I told you. If I go, she goes. Johnny, he's going to kill me. I was holding my gun at my side, but I didn't dare lift it, try to aim it. One false move on my part, and he pulled the trigger, blast the life out of Norma Wells. Then she struggled slightly, tried to pull away from him. I had a one-second chance, and I took it. <laughs> Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. Yes. I didn't have time to call the shot. I had to get it off fast. Yeah. Looks like it caught him in the heart. Expense account item 16, $231.25. Hotel and incidentals in Chicago and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $416.40. End of account, end of report. Remarks? A heart with a bullet hole in it. There's a real lonely heart. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the Callicles matter, which is just another way of saying the Greeks had a word for it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lucille Meredith, Mary Jane Croft, Virginia Gregg, Herb Ellis, Howard McNear, and Stacey Harris. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>